And the party that he affiliated with was the Communist Party and those people who were doing things like um, integrating a swimming pool in Berkeley or sending money to the um, to Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. And so he was asked later if he was a fellow traveler. And he admitted, yes, he was a, a, a fellow traveler. He was never, he claims he was never a Communist Party member, but he was a fellow traveler uh, with Communist Party um, um, activities. In 1943, um, Api, he's in Los Alamos, and he starts, and he tells some of the security guys there that actually there might be a possible security breach back in the Bay Area. Uh, that there has been a guy who has approached three scientists who are going to Los Alamos or at Los Alamos and has let, and have, have let them know that, um, that if, if he wants, if Oppy or these other scientists wanted to give information about the atomic bomb project to the Soviet Union that this guy would be the courier for that. And Oppy said that he told this guy he wasn't against sharing this information, but it wasn't up to him to decide, it was up to the president. Oppenheimer, in a way, was somewhat sympathetic with spreading the atomic secret around. I mean, once it was no longer a secret of nature, once the atomic pile in Chicago created this sustained chain reaction, especially once after Trinity, it was no longer a secret of nature, it was just a secret of man. And that secret was dispersed pretty quickly. I mean, it was dispersed even before Trinity. So he gave this information that there might, there might, there was this person who was asking for atomic secrets um, with the scientists. He gave that to the security personnel. And at one point, Oppie told Groves, you know, if you order me to give you the names, I'll give you the names. And about a month later, Groves came back and said, I order you to give me the names. And who Oppie said was this person who was approached him was Hokan Chevalier. We still don't know. There was a red flag over Oppenheimer that he had been approached. There was a big red flag over Hokan Chevalier. And Hokan Chevalier, a gifted linguist as well, um, had trouble finding work during World War II because of that. Uh, because that, that spread out pretty quickly, made it to his file. And then uh, he did do some translating at the trials of Nuremberg, but he eventually had to leave the United States because he had trouble finding work because of this red flag that Oppenheimer had put on, on one of his best friends during the 1930s. So Oppenheimer had this very peculiar um, thing where he was charming, he was charismatic. When you talk with him, he could be one-on-one -on -one and the conversation would be one of the best that you had. I mean, you, you would think that here was this incredibly talented, um, intelligent man talking with you and you're having a great conversation. But he could also say the exact wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. One of the early people who disliked him was Edward Teller. Edward Teller thought he should have been the head of the theoretical division during the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. And Oppenheimer get it, gave it to Hans Bethe instead. And I think Teller never quite forgave Oppenheimer that. The Air Force didn't particularly like Oppenheimer because he was arguing against strategic air command. Oppenheimer didn't support the hydrogen bomb. He said the atomic bomb was enough. We could get the job done. We, you know, it was a, it was an, it was a strong enough uh, offensive weapon that we didn't need an H-bomb. Um, but, but then after Truman said we're going with an H-bomb, here we have a photo of the H first H-bomb test uh, in 1952. Oppenheimer then backed off of his opposition with the H-bomb. Um, and then um, uh, Louis Strauss uh, became director of the Atomic Energy Commission when Eisenhower was elected in um, in 1952. Strauss had been on the Atomic Energy Commission, had cycled off that, and then Eisenhower offered Strauss uh, the, uh, uh, um, to become the, uh, the chair of the Atomic Energy Commission. And Strauss said, well, I'll do this, but we have to get rid of Oppie. So Strauss became a bitter enemy of, of Oppenheimer. So when he became head of the AEC, he targeted Oppie. He told Eisenhower he wanted to get rid of Oppie because some of this animosity that went back 
to the Manhattan Project days, and part of it was his Oppie's growing questioning of the path, of the nuclear path that the U.S. government was taking. Uh, a couple days before Christmas of 1953, um, Oppenheimer went into Straw's office, and Straws told him that he was having his security clearance revoked because of these questions about his, uh, his loyalty, and that Oppenheimer had two options. He could either quietly accept this decision and just lose his top security clearance and all of the, um, and all of the work that he did for the different AEC uh, boards, or he could have a, a security hearing, a security clearance hearing. Um, Oppenheimer, uh, went to his lawyer right away as soon as that meeting was over. And the FBI had anticipated this and it had put a phone tap, or put a, t a tap, a bug, in the lawyer's office. So from the very beginning, the FBI was listening to the privileged conversation between Oppenheimer and his lawyers, either in the office or by phone. Oppenheimer's worst witness against him. Himself. himself. And, and partly what had happened is the attorney, Rob, had a transcript of the 1943 conversations that Oppenheimer had um, with the Army intelligence, with Army security, about this, this contact that had been made to pass the atomic secrets to the Soviet Union in 1943. They had bugged the office, and, he had, and Oppenheimer didn't know until it was waved in front of his face at the security hearings that there was a transcript of uh, several conversations that he had with security. So, so he was, so Rob was, was, a, was an aggressive defense lawyer, practice trial lawyer. He was uh, used to catching um, people in, 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 in tripping them up with their own words. Um, also, it came out that uh, around this time in the summer of 1943, that Oppenheimer had taken a trip to the Bay Area on atomic bomb business, and then that night, after meeting with some professors and things, he went across to the Bay, and he spent the night at Jean Tatlock's house. Jean Tatlock was a former girlfriend of his, um, and she was a Communist Party member as well. At the end of June 1954, the AEC voted four to one against uh, reinstating Oppenheimer's security clearance. And what's really ironic, and probably shows you maybe the intent of what was going on, is that on July 1st of 1954, Oppenheimer's contract with the AEC would have lapsed naturally. So he would have, if they hadn't renewed his contract, he wouldn't have been working on any top secret stuff. But this was to discredit him. This was to fire the shot uh, over across the bow of any other scientist or anybody else who was starting to publicly, um, uh, publicly question the path that we were taking on the arms race.